We live in interesting times. Today's stories. Tamer is charged with corruption and money laundering. Gun attack by a student at a Crimea college leaves 19 dead. Migrant caravan begins new leg of journey in Guatemala. President Trump says he is not covering for Saudis in journalist disappearance. Hawaii hotel workers demand job security and better benefits. Plus, a new pop-up museum gives pizza lovers an extraordinary interactive experience. Hello everyone, I'm Anna Kui, bringing you stories from around the globe, and this is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Brazil's federal police on Tuesday asked the Prosecutor General's office to charge President Michel Temer and 10 others, including his daughter, with corruption, money laundering, and racketeering. The federal police investigated for more than a year whether Temer, who has been in power since May 2016, took bribes to issue a decree in May 2017 to benefit companies in the port sector. The prosecutor's office must now decide whether to file a criminal complaint against the president if it requests further investigation or to order the case closed. For the Supreme Court to investigate and possibly prosecute the president, according to the Constitution, it must get Congress's green light. In the report delivered Tuesday to the Supreme Court, federal police also requested that all those under investigation have their assets frozen. 78-year-old Tamer was denounced twice by the prosecutor's office last year for corruption and criminal organization training. And in both cases, the accusations were frozen by Congress until the end of his term on January 1, 2019. The new accusation comes less than two weeks before the second round of the presidential election. Ultra-conservative Jair Bolsonaro is leading in polls against lefties Fernando Haddad. Tamer is wrapping up his term as one of the most unpopular Brazilian presidents in decades. He has a 5% approval rating. The authorities said 19 people were killed and dozens more wounded, most of them teenagers, after a student opened fire in a technical college in Russian annex Crimea on Wednesday. Regional medical officials told TASS state news agency the toll rose to 19 on Wednesday afternoon. They said 39 remained hospitalized after the attack on the college in the city of Kerch on the peninsula annexed from Ukraine in 2014. Russia's investigative committee said the attack was carried out by 18-year-old student Vladislav Roslyakov. He was captured on security camera footage and later found dead with gunshot wounds. According to its website, Roslyakov enrolled at the college in 2015. RBK newspaper quoted an anonymous fellow student as saying, Rothviakov, quote, really hated the college because of evil teachers and hinted he would take revenge on them. Violent attacks on schools and colleges are extremely rare in Russia, but there have been several high-profile cases recently with far fewer victims. The investigative committee, which probes major incidents, had initially classified the attack as an act of terror and described it as an explosion. But it later said it was investigating a mass murder after, quote, this young man shot people dead in the college and then committed suicide, adding that all the victims died of gunshot wounds. The attack had first reported as an explosion and the Russia's National Anti-Terrorism Committee said an unidentified explosive device had gone off in the canteen. Committee spokesman Andrei Preshdomsky said that Rossiakov's body was found next to a pump action gun. A source in the emergency services told RIA Novosti State News Agency 
that Ross Lakov had legally acquired a gun license. Up next, migrant caravan begins new leg of journey in Guatemala. President Trump says he is not covering for Saudis in journalist disappearance. Hawaii hotel workers demand job security and better benefits. Eagle News Washington, D.C. will return in a moment. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Hundreds of Central American migrants leave shelters they stayed in overnight in Guatemala and continue their journey northward in hopes of reaching the United States. However, President Donald Trump on Tuesday warned Hondurans he will cut millions of dollars in aid if a group of about 2,000 migrants is allowed to reach the United States. A migrant caravan set out on Saturday from the impoverished, violence-plagued country and was headed north on the long journey through Guatemala and Mexico to the U.S. border. Trump, who has made cracking down on illegal immigration a keystone of his presidency, tweeted that U.S. aid to Honduras, which is planned to reach nearly 66 million in 2019, would end. He said, quote, the United States has strongly informed the president of Honduras that if the large caravan of people heading to the U.S. is not stopped and brought back to Honduras, no more money or aid will be given to Honduras, effective immediately. The president later warned Guatemala and El Salvador that they would face the same repercussions. He said, quote, We have today informed the countries of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador that if they allow their citizens or others to journey through their borders and up to the United States, with the intention of entering our country illegally, all payments made to them will stop. He said anybody entering the United States illegally will be arrested and detained prior to being sent back to their country. Guatemala announced it would stop the group from entering if they did not have the proper visas. According to local media reports, the migrants, including children, managed to reach a shelter in the southwestern Guatemalan city of Esquipulas on Monday. According to the United Nations, 500,000 people cross illegally over Mexico's southern border each year in the hope of making it to the United States. Most of them are fleeing violence and poverty in Central American countries. Honduras is a country of 9 million people, but around 1 million Hondurans live in the United States, most illegally. In other news, U.S. President Donald Trump on Wednesday denied that his cautious approach to Saudi Arabia over allegations that Saudi agents killed and dismembered a journalist amounts to covering for the U.S. ally. Well, I just want to find out what's happening. In fact, Secretary of State Pompeo is going to be back uh, probably late tonight or early tomorrow morning. He went to Turkey. He went all over. Uh, but he spent a lot of time with the Crown Prince and uh, he's going to have a full report. I'm not giving cover at all. Uh, with that being said, Saudi Arabia has been a very important ally of ours in the Middle East. They're an important ally, but I want to find out what happened, where is the fault, and we will probably know that by the end of the week. But Mike Pompeo is coming back. We're going to have a long talk. One job should be enough says the campaign and battle cry for nearly 3,000 hotel workers in Waikiki and Maui, two of Hawaii's top tourist destinations. Eagle News correspondent Ron Hamilton with this developing story. It has now been one whole week since thousands of hotel workers in Waikiki began protesting against their managers over alleged lack of pay and benefits. So far, there's no resolution in sight. Contract negotiations broke down between Union Local 5 and Kyoya, a Japanese-based company that owns five hotels, namely the Sheridan Waikiki, the Royal Hawaiian, the Moana Surfrider, Sheridan Princess Kaiulani, 
and the Sheridan Maui, some of which are currently ranked in the top 10 in Hawaii according to some websites. More than 2,700 hotel workers started their strike in the early morning of October 8th. Some staged themselves along Waikiki's Kalakaua Avenue to be seen and heard by visitors and residents, even to the point of creating disruption. Other protest groups gathered at more iconic locations, such as the beaches of Waikiki and the Moana Surfrider. Notice a limousine and several vehicles trying to get into the hotel's driveway. Many of the protesters happened to be Filipinos, such as union member Gemma Weinstein, who took the time to air out her frustrations in this interview. Uh, the workers are striking because their contract has expired and they need to make their, their uh, working condition uh, better, their uh, benefits better, and job security. Well, it will last as long as it takes. To, if, if they get the good contract, then they will go back to work. But till then, they will be outside at magwewelga hanggang matapos. It's very important to have job security for the workers, right? Okay, and but... living in Hawaii is so expensive. Napakamahal dito sa Hawaii. At uh, yung sweldo nila ngayon, it's not enough. At tapos ang uh, trabaho nila, they working like two people doing job before. Now it's only one doing two jobs. And ang, ang goal namin dito is to have one job should be enough to live dito sa Hawaii even if it's so expensive. Okay, Paul, anything else you want to let people of the Philippines know about Hawaii or working here or? Well, people, people in the Philippines, ito ang buhay namin sa America, sa Hawaii. Lumalaban, nakikibaka, para maging maganda ang future ng Hawaii at ang mga kababayan natin dito sa America. According to the union's website, support has poured in from other groups such as the sheet metal workers, airline employees, and teachers' unions. U.S. Senator Maisie Hirono even posted a tweet calling out corporate leaders to come to the negotiating table to ensure one job is enough for those working in Hawaii. Local 5 is part of the Unite Here Union. This past week, Unite Here went on strike against Marriott-managed hotels employing 7,000 union workers in seven cities. Boston, Detroit, San Diego, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. To date, there's still no official word from Kyo Ya Management Company. Just this week, Local 5 filed an unfair labor practice charge against Sheridan Maui, alleging violations of federal labor law against three of the hotel's employees charged with trespassing and subsequently bound from the property for one year. Ironically, last week, Kyo Ya allegedly said they're ready to welcome back the striking employees. Reporting from Honolulu, Hawaii, this is Ron Hamilton for Eagle News. I am one with 25. Thanks, Ron. When we come back, a new pop-up museum gives pizza lovers an extraordinary interactive experience. Eagle News Washington, D.C. will return shortly. This is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. I'm Anna Kui. A little pizza obsessed? Well, there is a place for that. Eagle News correspondent Diane Paras takes us to new pop-up museum, one that gives pizza lovers an extraordinary experience. Toppings included. In the United States, the month of October is considered as National Pizza Month. What better way to celebrate by enjoying one of LA's hottest pop-up museums that will surely give you a mouth-watering experience. The Pizza Experience, a brand new pop-up museum to open in the heart of Los Angeles, features 13 interactive pizza-themed rooms and activations. Currently, I'm in the Pizza Fitness Center. And if there's a place that I'll enroll for a new gym membership, it would be here.
The pizza gallery room will give you a different and cheesy perspective on classical works of art. A room that will make you feel like royalty? The Pizza Box Castle Room gives you a chance to walk down the pepperoni red carpet, experience the feeling of a true king or queen by sitting on a vegetable throne, and be served a slice of delicious round table pizza. I'm with Irana, an employee here at the Pizza Experience. What was the inspiration of the pizza experience? So the inspiration started with a husband and wife. They had a bet and um, it was all surrounding the question, what could you yeah. eat for the rest of your life and not get sick of? The wife said sandwiches, the husband mm -hmm. said pizza, and then they decided to try and put it to the test. Mm -hmm. So the husband went 45 days eating nothing but pizza and the wow. wife only made it 15 days eating sandwiches. And the husband, in addition to that, uh -huh. lost weight. So he's like, I'm gonna write a book about this experience. And the wife was like, okay, great idea. We'll have your book in the gift shop of a pop-up museum yeah. all about pizza because it was such a fun bet and fun experience that they wanted to like commemorate it. So that's how this happened. Oh, that is really interesting. So what can guests um, expect to take away from visiting this museum? I think what they can expect to take away is a really fun interactive experience because like they truly want everyone to just like be themselves, have fun, touch everything, the dough room, pick it up, throw it, like they just want everyone to like experience pizza in every sensory way uh -huh. they possibly can. Yeah, it's like very nice when you guys like have the, the arts and stuff too. Yeah! This is a great place to spend time with family and friends. It definitely took a pizza my heart. The pizza experience is currently open to the public and will continue to operate until early February of 2019. Not to be cheesy, but this was definitely an experience that I didn't even know I needed. I am Diane Paras and I am one with 25. Thanks, Diane. I know exactly what's for dinner tonight. That is today's Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Join us tomorrow for the weekend edition. Visit our websites at eaglenews.ph and eaglenewslive.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash eaglenewsph. Thank you for watching. I'm Anna Kui and I'm one with 25.